and welcome to another episode of Bushcraft Dave. Today is the final day of our Hadrian's Wall hike. It's, um, it's felt like an incredibly long week, a good one, challenging, hard work, but today will be the reward at the end of it all. Reaching bonus on Solway, 13 miles down the track. We've got a nice little place to stay. Might even dip our feet in the sea, if it is even the sea. We will find out. But thank you for joining us. 13 miles to go. Let's do this. Some of the marshes. Very straight road. Empty landscape in a straight road. <laughs> Speed it up. We were just talking about this road being a bit like the twilight zone. It just carries on forever and ever and ever. It's a two and a half mile stretch of absolutely straight road with these flats to one side of us heading towards the river. But the village or the little town, hamlet, whatever in the distance just doesn't seem to be getting any closer. We thought we might be on like a road treadmill that's just never ending. I think we're getting there. Oh. Well, we've paused in the little village of Glasson. Um, I think it's the there's another little village before Bowness called Port Carlisle, but we've stopped here, hoping there was a pub. There isn't. Or if there is, we can't find it. Or if there was, it maybe it's closed since the map was done. But we've stopped because we have done 90 miles on us feet now. I know the route's 84 miles altogether, but with the extra little drops off to pubs for food and places that we're staying, it is going to be 92.9 miles and we've done 90. So we're nearly there. We're about an hour away walking to Bowness. So we're going to rest up, see how we get on. We might have to break that last section up into a few little bits because <laughs> my feet are killing. Um, but we're nearly there. Come on, we can do it. So close. That's promising, isn't it? There's a bench there. And I can see the sea. Does that count? I don't know. Come on. 
set I'm gonna set up the camera here. Hang on. The end of Hadrian's Wall Path. Hold on, mate. Yes. Well done, Bushcraft <laughs> Dave. Oh. oh. Great place to stop. What a sense of achievement. Ah. We did it. And I know people do it like regularly, it's a regular hike for people to do. But that doesn't mean it's easy. It really isn't. 84 miles, however you decide to break it up, is a long way for your feet to take you. That pop to the shops that you sometimes do, Probably ain't even a mile. 84 miles. Should we head back to Newcastle now? Yeah. All right. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. 84 miles back. See you later. Thanks for watching. Come on, Alexi. Come on. <laughs> Only joking, only joking, we've got a nice little place to stay. We've got a hot tub. We're living the life of kings. Living the life of emperors. Oh yes. Give us a minute and we'll tell you, we'll, we'll have a bit of a chat about the whole thing, all right? Oh, give us a minute. Cheers. Great work, mate. Great work. Our final map time, day seven map time. Um, we left Valham House, heading back on the route that we went last time to rejoin the um, Hadrian's Wall Path there. We went through Grinsdale, went to Kirk Andrews on Eden, and here there was a diversion that brought, you couldn't take all of this route, it had been closed. So you had to just come off into the village and you would then follow the, the road up into Beaumont, which wasn't a big problem, not a big no. big, big issue it at all. It was overgrown and in, later in the season or earlier it might have been mown back. But... Yeah, and it was it was slightly uphill into Beaumont, not much, but a little bit uphill. And there was a pretty little church in Beaumont, but then you come through through the village and we're then walking across the fields all the way down to Burby Sands, a really nice village that was the resting place of King Edward the First, yeah. who died in a battle against Robert the Bruce. Um, so that was really cool. Not to, he died in the church. It's not cool that he died, obviously, but it's interesting. Not cool. You can't say it's cool that somebody's died. <laughs> um, but we we stopped there. We got to the pub a bit early. I think we got there about half eleven. Wasn't open yet, so we just chilled on the the benches outside the pub. Had a nice little panini that was super cheap, really. Yeah. Um, that just was going to fill us up for the rest of the trip because we knew that there would be other stopping points along the way. And then this was the longest, craziest stretch of road I've ever been on in my entire life. It was straight as anything. You could see absolutely for miles. So even when you set off out of the other side of... um. Well, I guess out of the other side of Longbur, yeah, you could see Drumbur on the far on horizon. the far horizon. It was so strange to see the place you go into, and all of that route you were just walking and walking and walking, and didn't ever feel like it was really getting any closer. And that was where we walked past some fields of cows, but you got beautiful views across this sort of yeah. Is it an estuary? Yeah, I think we're into estuary now. So it was really nice. It was really sunny, really hot, no shade. Um, 
but it was a really surreal experience and we just sort of benched up outside Drumber to rest up all of all of this route there's there's no wall at all but it does kind of point out where there were sites of a fort there was a castle in Drumber but it wasn't really a castle it was just a house that had been built using some stones from the wall um yeah so that's that Left Drumber. Oh, there were some public toilets there advertised, weren't there? Oh, not, yeah, not on the map, I think but you so. spotted the sign. Yes, I think Might so. Was handy. it maybe like where there was a campsite or something, something like that, maybe? Um Walk down this road, heading towards Drumber Reservoir, but you turn off, go around the back of some farms, cross the field, through to Glasson, where we were aiming to get to to get and stop at the pub on the corner. But the pub did not exist. It wasn't there anymore. No. And that was like kind of where we wanted to at least get a little bit more refreshment because we were not necessarily anything to eat, just maybe a drink. But it was closed, so we only really paused for a minute thinking we'll go to Port Carlisle and maybe stop at the pub there. Yeah, only, only one of the very few places that the map let us down. Yeah, absolutely. Bit, probably just because we're using a slightly outdated one. So this is a 2019 Harvey map. It's the only one they seem to sell. But certainly it looked like that pub in Glasson had been disused for a while. Um so we head to Port Carlisle, where we would fa- also found out that that one was, uh, well, maybe that was there. Because there was a pub called the Hope and Anchor, I think. That you couldn't find it on Google but Maps. I couldn't find it on you? Google Maps, which made me think that maybe it didn't exist. But it was when I was searching in glass on, and there was very little signal. So we decided we would just plow on to the end anyway. Um, past the little entry point to a little caravan park, up onto the road, and heading round Port Carlisle, where there was a. Um, it must have looked like fishing port or something that had been built at one point around here. Oh yeah, the big dock built mm. out of stone. Yeah. Yeah. And then round the other side, and we were we were picking up pace at this point because we knew we were into the home stretch. Yeah. Past a little house just on the corner, and into Bonus, and across the finish line. The end of our Hadrian's Wall walk. I'm just gonna get comfy now. Oh, All right, welcome. Then. Yes, the Bushcraft Dave's, what did you say it was going to be called? Out of the Bush. Out of the Bush. <sighs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to get past the sensors, I don't think. Um, so, we've done the walk. We've done all, for us, 93 miles of it. Um, 84 it should have been, which I think says everything about the way that I hike. <laughs> So what's your impressions? How have you enjoyed it? Loved it. Um, I think we thought after the three peaks we wanted a bit more of a challenge, didn't we? Mm. What was the next, what's our next project was the question and the answer was something like... Distance on it. Bigger, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, because the three peaks were a height stamina challenge and this was a much more long distance endurance. Yeah. So I loved the challenge, thought it was really good and the sights were fantastic as well. Absolutely. I think I was surprised by how little wall we saw over the seven days, really. Yeah. Um, we saw a tiny little bit of the wall at Hedden. Um, the, and that was only really at the beginning of day two. We hadn't seen it up to that point, had we? Yeah. And then day three, we started to see a bit more. Day four was pretty much all wall. Day five, we had a little bit more. And then day six and seven, I don't think we saw any at all, did we? So if you're going on this walk thinking that you are actually going to be walking on the wall from start to end, no, it ain't going to be like that at all. The no. opening and closing stretches, really, there's no wall at all. But when you get to it, those moments of seeing the wall are quite spectacular. And um, yeah. yeah, well, as we found out, the reality is that it's not been occupied or really in use since the year 410. Yeah. So since then, it's been pillaged for its stone, moved out of the way. Rights have been given to certain land landowners to just... Do what they like with it, yeah. Do what they like to make make new use of the land. So, and almost the only reason that there's any sections of the walls remaining is a few sort of visionaries who were like, "No, we need to yeah. take ownership of these bits of land, otherwise this this will be gone from the hillside forever." <clears throat> um, but there were other there were buildings that talked about how they were made using the stones from the wall because it was just easy. They were already cut. The wall wasn't in use. Yeah. Um, so the east and west extremes where they're much more built up. You're going to see that it's been yeah just gone ready for other hands gotten yeah. rid of for, for bigger better yeah. things yeah although apparently there is there is bits of the wall in Newcastle like just to the side of main roads and stuff still some bits that exist there yeah 
but in terms of walking the Hadrian's Wall path, you're not really going to get any at all for a long time. But it is. Uh, we talked a bit as well about how there's a, there's almost a bit of wall fatigue. That, like, but it's exciting to see the wall the first few times. But then eventually you're just like, ah, it's, it's more, it's more wall. Kind of loses its magic, which is sad, really. Mm. You get to your first turret and you're like, oh, that's cool. They had a turret on the wall and the first mile castle where they kept 50 soldiers and the first massive fort where they kept like 500. And you're like, oh, this is cool. And then eventually you're like, yes, yeah, another turret. Another mile castle. Yeah. Um, which is really weird. I don't, I don't think I was expecting to quite get so walled out. No. You do get to appreciate certain things. I didn't know until you told me that with this particular wall, they build the two faces first yeah. and then just infill the middle with with stuff and to look at it and see that you can tell where they've cut the faces of the front stones in the back and then just chucked it just in and chucked up all sorts of rubbish in and there was that bit where it said ah this is the site of a change of plan and yeah they, yeah it was, i thought it was really trees. good that they plain trees kept yeah. that bit because it's so well illustrated where the wider foundation came along and then the wall narrowed but you could see the, the yeah the, the, the wider done the foundation, foundation, for the whole foundation thing. remaining yeah so those were good. Those are good bits. Bits that held real bits of history. Yeah. I think I would have liked to have probably spent a bit more time on the walk. I think seven days has felt right. I, I, I don't know whether there is a right or wrong to how long you do the walk for. I think it depends on your stamina. I think it depends on how much you're carrying. Mm. We, we both talked, haven't we, about how we thought that we've, kept, we've brought too much stuff. Yeah. When, when we get back, we're going to weigh the bags... And we'll put here what my bag weighed. And we'll put <sighs> above here yeah. what Alexi's bag weighed. Um, because they are ridiculously heavy. And we saw other people quite comfortably strolling along with just a little day pack. There are companies that, that run, uh, if you wanted to come and do Hadrian's Wall, there are companies that you can employ that will sort out where you're going to go, what you're going to do, where you're going to stay. They'll pick up your bags and take it from one destination to the next. It's definitely worth something worth looking at if you want to take plenty of clothing and feel comfortable and you don't really want to re-wear stuff too many times. But I think there's a lot that I could save out of the bag. But I, I think um, I managed to wash my hiking shirt quite a few times. But there were occasions where it, it didn't really get dry because there weren't radiators on. We're in summer now, so people have not got the heating on. and so, so I think that's why a lot of the radiators weren't on, so we couldn't really get stuff dry. Yeah. Which is a bit bit of a pain. Um, but yeah, we could definitely carry less, which means you could maybe walk more. Or it could make walking the seven-day route that we've done a little bit more comfortable and a little bit less pressure on your back and your legs and stuff because it's been tough it's been challenging yeah what do you think about poles because we saw a lot of people with walking poles mm. and you took yours they did come in very handy for me we used them day four i think but did we use them at the end of day three because your foot was. was really hurting and then you started using it day four yeah but then you felt like your foot had sorted yourself out but an hour was knackered so i ended up using it for the rest of day four which was the really tough that that middle day was really really challenging. I think, I think I would break it up into two days yeah. and stop at once, brood. Well, what we found in general was that the brunt of it was definitely taken by our legs and particularly feet. Right? Yeah, the feet especially. But our arms did virtually nothing. So maybe if we'd both used poles the whole time, mm. it would have put our arms into action and worked worked our bodies more like a cross trainer than just a treadmill. I know a lot of long distance hikers use poles. Yeah. And so I think that was a that was a a potential error. I'm I'm glad I brought them. Yeah. Because we definitely needed them at that point, that day three, end of day three, start of day four, um, to be able to get through it. That leads nicely on to one of my top tips you asked me about earlier, mm. which is to listen to your body because yeah. it was just at the end of day two, I think. Maybe it was one, still on the banks of the river in Newcastle. I had a bit of rubbing on my heel. It was getting a bit hot. I could feel my foot shifting around a little bit. Um, but it didn't, it wasn't too bad. I, it felt like the skin on my heel was far too tight to blister or do anything mm. bad. So I thought, I'll just carry on going. 
got a big blister. I could barely stand on it day two, yeah. but had to keep going anyway. So then ended up not planting my heel at all in day two and purposefully stepping on the ball of my foot a bit more, planting my foot flat. But because I was constantly having to lift my foot up to do that, the tendon on the top yeah. of my foot started to kill. And that's why day three or four I needed the poles. So Absolutely. I'd say if there's something small niggling, get it checked out. Just stop, take your boot off, stick a plaster on. I mean, definitely take compedes with you. Yeah. Um, I I used three. I probably could have used more. Um, you definitely compete. You <clears throat> definitely need um, a tick key or a pair of tweezers. Um, you had two ticks. I had two ticks. I'd say don't worry about investing in a tick key. I, we it may just, have been using it wrong. Yeah, it but didn't seem to work for us. Tweezers I, were fine, weren't they? Yeah, we got hooked under and started twisting it, and nothing really happened. No. But with tweezers and a YouTube tutorial video. Yeah. Just carefully like and subscribe. <laughs> uh, carefully uh, pulling up, just pulled the tick right out. Yeah, you definitely need something. I, I, I've hiked for over like two and a half years on this channel now, and not got a single tick. And I've walked through brushes and bracken and all sorts in the peaks, never had anything. Um, but obviously, as you get closer to the north and you're walking in, in, in Scotland, especially, isn't it? It's yeah. That you get quite a lot of ticks. But I've never really thought about it. I always have the tick key and the tweezers in my first aid kit, which I, I always have with me. Um, this is the first time I've had to do it. And it was fairly early on, wasn't it? I think it was day two yeah. or day three. Yeah, it was a bit I didn't have any others after that. But if we hadn't got those out, um, obviously it can lead to long, longer term complications, can't it? So um, definitely tweezers and a tick key, um, or a tick key is, is a good idea. Blister plasters, definitely. Um, I ended up constantly using things like, uh, Volterol. like anti Volter or like any kind of anti-inflammatory gel on my knees and my my hips and my feet, just to kind of just to help keep things in check really. And that's part of carrying too much weight um, on my rucksack and walking maybe just a little bit more than my body was quite ready for at that point. So I think all, all in all, um, you've got to find the right balance of taking the amount of gear that you are going to actually use and need mm. and it's difficult to know that until you've done something like this but there's things that i wouldn't bother taking i would scale a lot of stuff back and i'd still use the same bag because the bag was a good size and it crammed everything that i wanted in but i could use a, i could have a lot less stuff in it um i carried two full bottles of water the first day which i didn't need to do because there's enough places along the way that you can stop and stay hydrated you need one bottle of water to just kind of keep you going throughout the day and I was using some um, hydration tablets as well you can get uh, I can't remember what the company's called so something like high five or something like that but you can get like little hydration tablets I was just lobbing one of them in my water on the morning just to make sure that at least throughout the course of the day I was staying hydrated yeah um, but it was a real mixture of weather we, we didn't other than that first day as we were approaching the walk up into Hedden and bits and pieces through Newcastle we didn't really need the waterproofs. I, I certainly wouldn't be bo that bothered about waterproof trousers. No, I've tra got Trousers get wet, you, they them. get wet, um, and you try and dry them off the best you can, you stick them on the next day, and if it's sunny, they'll dry. But definitely just a waterproof jacket. I don't think I really wore a jumper other than like now, just to relax, really. Now we're on, on yeah. the end straight of it. It was really mild the whole time, and if I knew I was going to be wearing the waterproof, mm. I wore virtually a vest because yeah, I knew yeah. I was going to be hot under it. Mm. You always get really warm. Toiletries is another thing. If you're staying in Airbnbs, hostels and shepherd huts yeah. uh, and hotels like us, you don't need all of this. I no. brought suntan lotion, after sun, talcum powder, deodorant, toothpaste, toothbrush, moisturiser. There were, there were towels and some yeah. lovely fruity scented shampoos in every place we stayed. Yeah. I could have just bought brought the toothbrush tooth toothpaste, toothbrush and maybe the deodorant and that's it yeah. instead of all of that. Yeah, you don't need a lot if I mean I know some people do hike this stuff and they take you know you you're taking your rucksack with your tent and all that stuff in and fair play to you. But I didn't see lots of um campsites along the way really and it isn't an area where where wild camping is legal. I'm sure some of you might do it anyway but uh there's there's plenty of places to stay. Yeah. And why not, if you've been hiking all day, have a little bit of luxury of a comfy bed. Um, 
It TV tells... on to watch Scrap Heap Challenge. Yeah. You being the fantastic planner of this whole trip, you did find though that it dictated the length of the day a little bit, mm, didn't yeah. you? If you were looking for a 10 mile stopping point and there wasn't anywhere yeah. there, you'd have to go much shorter or much longer. Yeah, there were, it was difficult along the, along the way, but I, I still think that there are a few little B&Bs that aren't on that map. Yeah. And aren't on, aren't on well, they must be on Google Maps somewhere, but maybe you've got to really be zoomed in on each of those little villages, yeah. almost following the path of the wall, relatively well zoomed in, and keep searching hotels, B&B, hotels, B&B, because there, there was a couple more that were just hidden out of the way, that weren't on, on the main route at all, that was a little B&B, or an independent hostel, stuff like that. But actually the places we've stayed have, have ended up working out pretty well. Yeah, um, all lovely. Yeah. Even this bunk bed. And I wonder whether you, you could even, like us, take advantage of the people who move luggage from one place to the next. You might not employ them in terms of organizing your hotels and stuff like that, but you might be able to pay a company to actually shift your gear for you to come and pick up your gear at that place in the morning and then take it to your next destination that's definitely worth investigating but all in all i've loved the walk i've loved the challenge of it it's been uh, it's been the furthest i've ever walked continually the um you know to do 93 miles in seven days is is a hell of a lot my body is going to take a good couple of days to recover and readjust from it all, I think. Yeah. To get to day five or six, I think, and realise that we'd walked the equivalent length of three marathons Yeah, was really rewarding. Yeah, to know how far we've done. And we're daft enough to already be starting to think about ne next year as well, so it clearly hasn't put us off um, trying to do some other adventures and stuff along the way. Uh, maybe in the comments you could give us some tips and advice of maybe what we could do Next, where should we go and hike? What sort of stuff should we do? Um, I think we probably want to do something a little bit shorter next time. Yeah, just, not just to, it's summer holidays for us and it'd be nice to maybe do it a few, like four days, five days, something like that. Not Land's End to John O'Groats. Not Land's End to John O'Groats, Great Wall of China, we're not doing that. <laughs> um, something relatively small and piecemeal, and um, but we've got a few ideas ourselves already, but yeah. If there's anything you think about what we could maybe go and walk next or a little challenge we could try and do, let us know. But it's been a fantastic hike. Very much appreciate having uh, Mr Motivator here to help, help get me through some of the bits where I was like, could we call a taxi? Can we can we, can we just get a bus from here? And those uh, thoughts started to creep oh, in. Oh, yeah, them little, little thoughts of, uh, you can't do this. But um, Thank you, Alexi. It's been an absolute pleasure again. Thank you, Bushcraft Dave, for thank organising you, it all. That was fantastic. Absolute pleasure. And we'll on to the next one. Um, if I haven't already said it, thank you for joining us um, and we'll see you in the next one. Oh gosh, hand in front of the camera. Uh, Get it together, Dave. Come on. Filming. All right.